Hi and welcome to my lecture on pediatric and adolescent gynecology. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Tokina Ubigayne. Here are the references for this lecture. And here's the outline of this lecture. So first off, we start with the gynecologic examination of a child. Effort should be devoted to gaining the child's confidence and establishing rapport with the child. Because if, if the interaction is poor during the first visit with the child, the negative experience will detract from future physician-patient interactions. There should be gentleness and patience with the time spent with the child, and the physician should not seem to be hurried or rushed. One excellent technique is for the physician to sit instead of standing during the initial encounter, and this conveys an unhurried approach. Many gynecologic conditions in children can be diagnosed by inspection alone. When performing a gynecologic exam in a child, the components for a complete pediatric examination include the following. Of course, history, inspection with visualization of the external genitalia, and a non-invasive visualization of the vagina in the cervix. However, if only necessary, we can also do a rectal exam or a gynecologic exam under anesthesia. For the history, of course, obtaining a history from a child is not an easy process, and much of the history must be obtained from the parents or the guardians. We can educate the child on vocabulary to describe the genital area, and one way to describe the genital area in breast is to call them private areas and define this term as meaning areas that are covered by a bathing suit. When evaluating the external genitalia, we can do this position. So, the infant may be examined on her mother's lap, or young children may be examined in the frog-like position while sitting on their mother's lap, such as this picture here. We can also put the child in a lithotomy position, but this position is generally used only for older children, such as those children aged 4 to 5 years old. Once the child is positioned, the vulvar area and introitus should be inspected. Many gynecologic conditions in children may be diagnosed by inspection. And for visualization of the introitus, we can either do a gentle downward lateral traction on the thighs, or we can also ask the older child to do a valsalva maneuver. For the non-invasive visualization of the vagina and the cervix, this can be accomplished without the use of any insertion of instruments. One method by which we can do this is to utilize the knee chest position, such as this uh, diagram here. In the knee chest position, the vagina will fill with air, thus aiding in the evaluation of the vagina in the cervix. So what we do is that an assistant pulls upward and outward on the labia mohora on one side, and you as the examiner will do the same with the non-dominant hand on the contralateral labia. So an otoscope or an ophthalmoscope can be used as a magnifying instrument and a light source, but this instrument should not be inserted into the vagina. While the light from the otoscope or the ophthalmoscope is shown into the vagina, the examiner can evaluate the vaginal walls and visualize the cervix as a transverse ridge. A foreign object may also be visualized using this technique. Following inspection of the vagina and the cervix, vaginal secretions may be obtained for microscopic examination and culture. And later on, I will show you how to actually obtain vaginal secretions for microscopic examination and culture. We can also use a colposcope in the examination of the vulva in the child, especially when we suspect uh, cases of sexual abuse. So the colposcope can magnify that area being examined and also allows photography of the area of interest. However, magnification using an otoscope, as I've already said, or an ophthalmoscope without using a speculum, we can also use a hand lens or a 35mm camera with macro lens can also be used. So as I've said, no, how do we obtain cultures and other specimens from children? If the child is awake, Kalji swabs, such as this one in the picture here, can be moistened with sterile saline and used to obtain the specimen by gently inserting the swab through the hymenal ring without actually touching the edges of the hymen. You can also use a soft sterile eyedropper or a small feeding tube such as this one 
or a urethral catheter with a syringe can be gently inserted through the hymenal opening to aspirate secretions or to obtain a vaginal wash sample. This, uh, we can also use saline squirted into the vagina while three swabs are held near the hymenal ring with the labia manually closed over them. So the child is then asked to cough to expel the saline from the vagina onto the swabs. Now, only when needed, we can also do rectal exam. So the most stressing aspect of the examination may be omitted depending on the child's symptoms. And the common reasons to perform a rectal exam are the following. So genital tract bleeding, pelvic pain, and suspicion of a foreign body or a pelvic mass. The normal prepubertal uterus and ovaries are non-palpable on rectal exam. The, the relative size ratio of cervix to uterus is 2 is to 1 in a child, and this is in contrast to the ratio in the adult, which is 1 is to 2. Except for the cervix, any mass discovered on rectal exam in a prepubertal exam should be considered abnormal. The goal of the examination is to obtain information without traumatizing the child, of course. However, there are times when an adequate examination cannot be performed in the office setting, and so an examination under anesthesia may be needed. When performing an anesthesia examination, a lighted Killian nasal speculum, such as this one here, or a fiber optic scope, probably a cystoscope or a flexible hysteroscope, such as this one here, are useful for examining a prepubertal vagina. A liquid distension media can be used for vaginoscopy in order to visualize the whole vagina and the cervix. And uh, since this patient is already under anesthesia, vaginal cultures can be easily obtained prior to vaginoscopy. We can also use the maturation index, especially if we already are planning to do vaginal swab anyway. However, the use of maturation index is rarely used, but it provides information about the pathophysiology of estrogen effect on the vaginal mucosa. So girls with precocious pubertal development may rarely and only if atraumatic have a vaginal smear obtained as part of their evaluation to determine degree of estrogenization. We can also use maturation index to evaluate adolescents with amenorrhea if visual inspection does not confirm estrogen effect on the vaginal mucosa. So with the maturation index, we use the micelle system. So uh, 100 cells are counted and scored 0 points for parabasal cells, 1 half point for intermediate cells, and 1 point for superficial cells. So the sum of points will be interpreted as follows. 60 to 70 points for newborns, 0 to 30 points for prepubertal girl, 31 to 45 points for a hypoestrogenic female, 45 to 60 points for the puber pubertal female, and 90 to 100 points for the hyperestrogenic female. We can also use the vaginal pH when we're doing the vaginal swab. So the vaginal pH in prepubertal and pubertal girls is 6.5 to 7.5 and 3.5 to 4.5 respectively. Therefore, vaginal pH is not really useful for diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis and vaginal trichomonas infection among prepubertal girls. So now let's talk about performing gynecologic exam in the adolescent. Many female adolescents do not want their mother, guardian, or other observers in the examining room. So maybe it's better that you tell the guardian or the mother that you will have a private session with this uh, female adolescent. So in many adolescent gynecology visits, a full pelvic exam will be unnecessary. Adolescents often come for examinations with preconceived ideas that it will be very painful. No, teens should be assured that although the exam may, be, may include mild discomfort, it will not be painful. You can also use the extinction phenomenon. So the examiner provides pressure lateral to the introitus on the perineum prior to insertion of a speculum only if needed. And here are the common indications for a pelvic exam in the adolescent. So when the patient has delayed puberty, pelvic pain, suspicion of intra-abdominal disease, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, undiagnosed vaginal discharge, or inability to place tampons. Now we discussed some normal findings, uh, especially in the hymen and the vagina of a prepubertal child. So for the hymen, 
So the hymens are often crescent-shaped but may be annular or ring-like in configuration. So sometimes you may see that they have septum such as this one, microperforations, finger-like extensions, or sometimes hymen can be completely imperforate. A mounding of hymenal tissue is often called a bump. And bumps are usually a normal variant and are often attached to longitudinal ridges within the vagina. Hymens in newborns are estrogenized, resulting in a thick elastic redundancy. Older, unestrogenized girls will have thin, non-elastic hymens. Midline sparing or the linea vestibularis refers to a symmetric, flat, avascular area of the posterior vestibule observed in 10% of normal newborns. It can sometimes be confused with scarring, which usually occurs in the hymen and posterior foreshed. For the vagina, so the vaginal epithelium of the prepubertal child appears redder and thinner than the vagina of a woman in her reproductive years. The vagina is around 4 to 6 centimeters long, and the secretions in the prepubertal child have a neutral or slightly alkaline pH. Recurrent vulvovaginitis, persistent bleeding, suspicion of a foreign body or neoplasm, and congenital anomalies may be indications for vaginoscopy. The prepubertal vagina is narrower, thinner, and lacking in the distensibility of the vagina of a woman in her reproductive years. In this section, we talk about problems in uh, prepubertal children. So the first problem usually, and the uh, most common problem among prepubertal children is vulvovaginitis, the nonspecific vulvovaginitis in particular. So the nonspecific vulvovaginitis is the most common gynecologic problem in, among prepubertal females. And this typically presents with irritation, itching, burning, and discomfort of the vulvar skin with or without the presence of vaginal discharge or erythema. Note that the prepubertal vagina is usually neutral or slightly alkaline. So with puberty, vagina becomes acidic under the influence of bacilli dependent on a glycogenated estrogen-dependent vagina. Breast budding, of course, you know, as I've mentioned already in a separate lecture, is a reliable sign that the vaginal pH is shifting to an acidic environment. There are physiologic and behavioral reasons why a child is susceptible to vulvar infection or to nonspecific vulvovaginitis. And here are the physiologic reasons. Number one, the child's vulva and vagina are exposed to bacterial contamination from the rectum more frequently than are the adults. Number two, because the, child's, uh, the child lacks the labial fat pads and pubic hair of the adult, when a child squats, the lower one-third of the vagina is unprotected and open. Number three, there is no, no significant geographic barrier between the vagina and the anus. And number four, the vulvar and vaginal epithelium lack the protective effects of estrogen and thus are sensitive to irritation or infection. Number five, the epithelium or the vaginal epithelium of a prepubertal child has a neutral or slightly alkaline pH, which provides an excellent medium for bacterial growth. And lastly, number six, the vagina of a child lacks glycogen, lactobacilli, and a sufficient level of antibodies to help resist infection. Note that the normal vagina of a prepubertal child is colonized by, by an average of nine different species of bacteria, so four aerobic and facultative anaerobic species and five obligatory anaerobic species. Now here are the behavioral reasons why the child is very prone to nonspecific vulvovaginitis. A major factor in childhood vulvovaginitis or nonspecific vulvovaginitis is poor perineal hygiene. This results from the anatomic proximity of the rectum and the vagina, and most youngsters are unsupervised when they defecate. Many youngsters wipe their anus also from posterior to, to anterior and thus inoculate the vulvar skin with intestinal flora. A minor vulvar irritation may result in a scratch itch cycle with the possibility of secondary seeding because children wash their hands infrequently. And the children's clothing is often tight-fitting and non-absorbent, non which keeps the vulvar skin irritated, warm, moist, and prone to vulvovaginitis. 
Now, here are the etiolo etiologic factors of premenarcheal vulvovaginitis. So, aside from nonspecific vulvovaginitis, we have here some, uh, some other vulvovaginitis caused by the bacteria, my, uh, mycotic vulvovaginitis, protozoal vulvovaginitis, even vulvovaginitis that is caused by helminthiasis in a viral or a bacterial systemic illness. So as I mentioned, vulvovaginitis can also be secondary to uh, pinworms. So approximately 20% of female children infected with pinworms or the enterobius vermicularis may develop vulvovaginitis. The, the classic symptom of pinworms uh, will be nocturnal vulvar and perianal itching. So at night, the milk-white pin-sized adult worms migrate from the rectum to the skin of the vulva to deposit eggs. And they may be discovered by means of a flashlight or better, you know, by dabbing of the vulva skin with clear cellophane adhesive tape, ideally before the child has arisen in the morning. So the tape is subsequently examined under the microscope. There is also bacterial vulvovaginitis among this age group. And the most common pathogens in the pediatric population are from the enteric and respiratory organisms. There is a greater risk of transfer of bacteria from the respiratory tract from the nose and fecal sources due to poorer hygiene in this young age group. The most common pathogens in symptomatic patients include the following. So there could be group A streptococci, beta hemolytic, that's uh, strep pyogenes, group B streptococci, beta hemolytic, so that's a strep agalactiae. There's also staphylococcus coagulis positive, so that's staph aureus. So there could also be Haemophilus influenza, Escherichia coli, Enterococcus fecalis, Klebsiella pneumonia, and Shigella. Now, if risk factors for sexual abuse are present, screening for sexually transmitted infections may also be needed. There's also vulvovaginitis, a secondary to mycotic infections. However, mycotic vaginal infections are not very common among prepubertal children as the alkaline pH of the vagina does not support fungal growth. Mycotic vaginal infections, if they are seen, may be suspected among immunosuppressed prepubertal girls such as HIV patients or patients on chronic steroid therapy. Here are the differential diagnoses for uh, pediatric vulvovaginitis. This can include foreign body, primary vulvar skin disease, an ectopic ureter, which is a rare anomaly, child abuse, and systemic skin diseases such as lichen sclerosis, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, and atopic dermatitis. So what is the recommended treatment for vulvovaginitis? The foundation of treating vulvovaginitis in the child is the improvement of local perineal hygiene. Treatment begins with educating parents and caregivers about vulvar hygiene measures. The majority of symptoms improve with hygienic changes and hot seats bath. Topical emollients can provide symptomatic relief, and the relief of vulvar irritation may be facilitated by using a bland cream such as zinc oxide creams or cod liver oil creams. Of course, we also have to advise avoiding contact irritants such as harsh soaps, bubble baths, identifying irritants such as lotions, laundry detergent, and scented products will be very important. Uh, we can also teach the child the proper wiping technique, emphasizing front-to-back wiping. And um, for patients with recalcitrant cases, we can um, apply low-potency steroids or even give the patient uh, oral antibiotics for 10 to 14 days, especially if this um, vulvovaginitis is secondary to um, a bacterial infection. We can also do some vaginal cultures to help us determine the choice of an oral antibiotic. However, Cultures usually will not show a specific pathogen, especially as I've already mentioned, the most common type of vulvovaginitis among pediatric age is the non-specific vulvovaginitis. However, in recurrent cases, a broad-spectrum antibiotic may be appropriate to decrease the E. coli inoculums, especially in children with vulvovaginitis secondary to bacterial infection. Another 
Abnormality that is um, common among the pediatric age will be labial adhesions or what we call adhesive vulvitis. Denuded epithelium of adjacent labia minora agglutinates and fuses the two labia together, creating a flat appearance of the vulvar surface. Now, a telltale somewhat translucent vertical midline line, this is the midline line, or the raphe, is visible on physical exam at the site of agglutination. So, this thin narrow line here in a vertical direction is pathognomonic for labial adhesions. Labial adhesions are most common among young girls between the ages of 2 and 6 years old. So, estrogen reaches a nadir during this time, predisposing the non-estrogenized labia to denudation. So, in one large study, the average age of a child with agglutination of the labia was 2 and a half years old, and 90% of cases appeared before the age of 6 years old. Now, how do we treat labial adhesions? Actually, no treatment is absolutely necessary or mandatory for patients with labial adhesions unless, of course, the child is symptomatic. And what would these symptoms be? Symptoms may include voiding difficulties, recurrent vulvovaginitis, discomfort from the labia pulling at the line of adhesions, and in rare cases, bleeding from the line of adhesion that is pulled apart. Now, um, why do we don't advocate treatment? It's because spontaneous separation of the adhesive vulvitis is very possible within 6 to 18 months. Now, one of the rules here will be do not attempt to separate the adhesions apart in the office setting by pulling on the labia minora, okay? Because attempt to separate that adhesion will be very painful for the child and the raw edges are likely to re-adhese anyway. The most commonly utilized treatment for this condition, only if treatment is necessary, is topical estrogen cream 0.01%. And you can dab this topical estrogen cream on the labia two times per day at the site of the fusion. So usually, this results in spontaneous separation in approximately two to eight weeks. The caregiver should be instructed to apply the cream on the line only as the lateral pigmentation indicates the estrogen is being applied lateral to the actual adhesion. So another gynecologic condition that is common among the pediatric age group is the physiologic discharge of puberty. This is a gray-white uh, colored uh, discharge which may appear slightly yellow at times. And this represents the disquamation of the vaginal epithelium. The estrogenic environment allows acid-producing bacilli to become part of the normal vaginal ecosystem. Now, the acids the bacilli produce cause a desquamation of the prepubertal vaginal epithelium. The only treatment necessary is reassurance for both the mother and the child that this is a normal physiologic process and will subside with time. Symptomatic children may be treated with hot sits bath and frequent changing of the underwear. No antibiotics are needed for physiologic discharge of puberty. Another gynecologic condition which we encounter, although rare in children, is the urethral prolapse. The most common presentation for urethral prolapse is not really actually a urinary symptom, but prepubertal bleeding. Usually, there's a sharp increase in abdominal pressure such as coughing that precedes urethral prolapse. The distal aspect of the urethral mucosa, as you can see in this picture, may be prolapsed along the entire 360 degrees of the urethra and uh, producing this uh, red donut-like structure. It is critical to distinguish urethral prolapse from grape-like masses of the sarcoma botryoides that originate from the vagina. And this picture here shows us a case of sarcoma botryoides. So, Treatment for the urethral prolapse is conservative and non-interventional and we can apply various medications include estrogen creams and antibiotic ointments and usually surgery is only necessary where necrosis is obviously present. We can also note lichen sclerosis or lichen sclerosis atrophicus. The most common presenting symptoms of lichen sclerosis is vulvar pruritus, discomfort, 
dysuria, and constipation. So vaginal bleeding can also occur due to extensive scratching and fissure formation. Some patients with lichen sclerosis are asymptomatic at presentation. The cause for lichen sclerosis is unclear but may be associated with autoimmune phenomena. Histologically, there is thinning of the vulvar epithelium with loss of the retipegs. Lesions are always limited by the labia mohora. If lesions go beyond the labia mohora, then the condition is unlikely to be lichen sclerosis. The lesion often appears as an hourglass or a figure of eight formation, such as what you see here in this picture. So you have a figure of eight formation here involving the genital and the perineal or the perianal area. The skin may be lichenified, such as what you see in this picture, with a parchment-like appearance. Parents may note that the genital area appears whitened. In cases where the diagnosis is unclear, a small punch biopsy may confirm the diagnosis. The treatment of lichen sclerosis among children should always start with avoiding irritation or trauma to the genital epithelium. Lichen sclerosis is a skin disorder in which lesions are most likely to occur in epithelium that is irritated. We can also apply high-potency steroids such as clobetazol as the initial step in treatment of this condition. Tapering the steroid level should be considered as soon as the response is seen or within a 4-6 to six week interval. Tapering can be achieved by following the initial treatment with a 2-3 to three week, week, week of mid-potency steroids such as betamethasone and conclude with 1% hydrocortisone for another 2 weeks. The use of ointments is preferred over creams given there is less irritation compared with creams and the petroleum base of ointments appear to help it stay in place longer. Now, um, some prepubertal children or even prepubertal children may manifest with vaginal bleeding. And here, the differential diagnosis of uh, bleeding without any breast development. So, one of the most common uh, causes of vaginal bleeding would be foreign object and, of course, genital trauma and sexual abuse. Okay, as I've already mentioned, uh, vaginal bleeding can also uh, happen in cases of lichen sclerosis. So other conditions include uh, infectious vaginitis, urethral prolapse, breakdown of labial lesions, friable genital warts or vulvar lesions, a vaginal tumor, a rare presentation of McCune Albright syndrome, isolated menorrhage, dermatologic conditions with the secondary excoriation, and of course non-genital bleeding that are uh, mistaken as genital, such as when this patient presents with a rectal or a urinary sources of, vagin of bleeding. Also, as I've mentioned, foreign bodies is one of the most common conditions among prepubertal children. And majority of foreign bodies are found in girls between uh, ages 3 and 9. And uh, children place this object inside their vagina as they are exploring their bodies. And the most common foreign body that is found among these children are small wads of toilet paper. The classic symptom of foreign bodies inside the vagina is a foul, bloody vaginal discharge. However, the discharge is often purulent and most often without blood. Now, the presence of unexplained vaginal bleeding is an indication for vaginoscopy. Vulvar trauma, secondary to lacerations and straddle injury are also very common among prepubertal children and one of the most common causes of genital trauma of course is the straddle injury. Common straddle injuries in uh, children occur in playground climbing structures such as the monkey bar or the fence rails. A straddle injury generally results in unilateral and superficial injury and very uh, rarely involves the hymen. The lack of the mature reproductive woman's fat pad in the vulvar area of the child predisposes this young child to bleeding from trauma. For the neonatal ovarian cyst, so simple cystic ovarian masses among newborns and units can be followed expectantly, so there's really no need for an urgent surgery uh, for this age group. Although the parents should be given uh, ovarian torsion warnings, and if the infant presents with acute vomiting or abdominal pain, then 
this infant should be immediately evaluated for ovari ovarian torsion. Serial ultrasonography should be performed approximately monthly until the cyst resolves. And usually malignancy is not a consideration among newborns. And for the possibility of large cysts or for the findings of a large cyst among this uh, age group, then we can just uh, do ultrasound-guided aspiration. Now, for ovarian cysts in children and adolescents, the management of uh, cystic ovarian structures in children and adolescents should be uh, expectant also, unless, of course, they are extremely large or if the ultrasound findings point to a pathologic tumor. Now, pain from ovarian cysts generally stems from three sources. Now, expansion of the ovarian cortex, which is typically during the growth phase of follicles and lasts less than 72 hours. Peritoneal bleeding from rupture, particularly common in bleeding disorders in patients with warfarin. And of course, ovarian torsion. Now, if of course, if patients already present with uh, bleeding from rupture and ovarian torsion, then this will need um, urgent surgical exploration. Germ cell tumors are the most common gynecologic neoplasm in this age group, and these are usually the teratomas or a dermoid cyst. And the most common malignant germ cell tumor is the this germinoma followed by endodermal sinus tumors. The most common clinical manifestation of an ovarian tumor is lower abdominal pain or the presence of a mass on ultrasound. Adnexal masses in children are more frequently associated with acute complications such as torsion, hemorrhage, and rupture than in adults. And surgical therapy, if needed, should have two goals. First is the removal of the neoplasm and appropriate staging. And of course, we have to preserve future fertility. That's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Lokina Abigaine. Thank you.